Salvador Allende was uh, president of Chile between 1970 and 1973 when he was overthrown in a coup. Uh, but before that, he had a long life of involvement in Chilean politics and Chilean society and in the formation of the Chilean left that took him uh, to government in 1970. Allende was born into a middle-class family um, which moved around a lot because of his father's job as a, a notary. So by the time he was a teenager, he'd really experienced a lot more of Chile than most Chileans at the time. He also was growing up at a time when the Chilean economy, much like today in Chile, funnily enough, when the economic and social and political systems were all straining. They couldn't cope with the challenges that were facing society. And there was a lot of ferment. New political organizations were being founded and so on. When Allende arrived to university to study medicine, he actively participated in many of these debates. Um, he also came into university at the time when um, Chile fell under a dictatorship. And so his early student life was dedicated to fighting for democracy. So here we already see some of the key themes of Allende's life, you know, the struggle for democracy, a belief in pluralism, and also a challenge to capitalism, an understanding that capitalism cannot resolve the problems of uh, a, so a society with an unjust economy and also cannot allow human beings to realize themselves as, uh, as fully as possible. But it also his experiences as a doctor and as a, um, a pathologist and his experiences in working in a psychiatric home in Santiago all provide him with the evidence that he needed in order to push him towards a radical position with regards to capitalism. Because he saw the suffering, he saw the poverty, and he saw that all of these deaths and this, this illness that he was dealing with was created by a system, a brutal and violent system which destroyed human beings. So through the 1930s what we see is a an increasing dedication to understanding politics, really, and increasing involvement in a new political party called the Socialist Party, which then led him to power. Agenda had a deep historical sense, a sense of his place in history, but also a sense of the importance of history in uh, the development of a people towards real sovereignty and towards um, socialism, a transformation of society. So in Latin America and in Chile, he was able to look back at the independence struggles and at the ideals that were, uh, that drove that independence struggle from Spain. Um, and compare the reality that Chile was living at the time with those ideals and say, well, we've fallen short. Within his family, he had a strong tradition of radicalism. You know, his uh, uh, great uncles had fought in the independence struggle. His grandfather was a well-known radical politician who pushed strongly for the secularization of the state, who founded hospitals, and um, who was actually known as Allende the Red uh, uh, during his lifetime. And Allende took great inspiration from this legacy, both within his family, but also this legacy, the broader legacy of the independence struggles. And so through his whole life, this sense of history, the sense of Chile's constant struggle against external domination, first against Spain, later against other powers such as Britain and, and the United States, really permeated his life and politics. Allende's government from the beginning ran into stiff opposition, especially from outside Chile. Um, and then gradually as his government progressed, the opposition within Chile coalesced more and more and became more and more radical. And so these two factors came together eventually um, to create the conditions where his government was overthrown in a coup on 11th of September 1973. Now, the circumstances of his death uh, and the overthrow of his government were a kind of paralysis within the popular unity government um, and an increasing radicalization of the opposition. There were increasing attempts to destabilize his government uh, that were you know, carried out by Chileans but with a lot of support from outside and financing from outside. Um, and in 1973, there was even a, a rehearsal for the coup. Um, and so Allende knew this was coming. You know, there are, there are many testimonies of him talking about um, 
how he would confront a coup if he had to. He, he wasn't saying how other people had to confront the coup, but how he as president of Chile with a mandate from the Chilean people would confront his destiny. You know, and his destiny was either to fulfill that mandate or to die in the place that Chilean people had put him. And so on the day of the coup, Allende goes to the presidential palace, which is where he'd always said he'd go, although people said to him that it would be better to go to other places that were more defensible and lead a resistance and so on. He would say no. And this is what we see on the last day of his government and of his life. He goes to the presidential palace. It is surrounded by army troops, by rebel troops. And along with a handful of defenders, he defends that palace for several hours under aerial bombardment, bombardment from tanks and machine guns and so on. And in the end, um, although there is still some controversy over exactly how he died, I think it's more likely that he died by suicide, simply because we have testimonies that this is that he'd said this was what he was going to do. We have testimonies that he did this. We also have. Um, the, the fact that he had a, an understanding of history. There was a previous president of Chile called, uh, from the 19th century, a man called Balmaceda, who committed suicide in the Argentinian embassy after the defeat of his government in 1891. And Allende was you know, a man who knew his history. He knew that this was, there was a precedent for this kind of thing in Chile. And it was the honorable thing to do. And Allende was a man of honor in, in a very old-fashioned sense. The path that he created to power is extremely relevant today because it's a peaceful, democratic path to power. And you could argue that Chavez and Correa and other progressive leaders in Latin America at the moment are actually following an agendista path towards uh, socialist transformation.